Happy Thursday, everybody. I'm Jade Scott. This is Growth RX, and today we are joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Nick Schuster, all the way from Brisbane. How are you, Nick? I'm awesome, Jade. I'm really good. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a pretty fun time for the next half hour, 45. It's going to be really good. So uh, very keen. Thanks for joining us all the way from Brisbane. You are a physiotherapist. You're a physiotherapist, osteo, uh, business owner and coach, the ultimate physio. Um, so we'll hear a little bit about more yeah, about so, you. Uh, I, uh, Allied Health is all I really know, Jade. My first job, uh, well, not my first job, my first professional job at age 21 was my own clinic. So I've been a clinic owner for 18 years now, as well as a physio little old North Brisbane and I've been working with clinic owners for about a bit over four years, four and a half years. Ultimate Physio is a business that works with clinic owners in time, profit and freedom in their businesses. And we're working with them with business leadership and personal development education. And yeah, I've known you for a bit over a year and I've, we've shared so many awesome conversations and topics and we've spoken together and yeah, you've introduced me to your wonderful community. Thank you. So obviously, we'd, before we kind of get into it, there's no one better that I think that could join me when it comes to hiring, interviewing, it, leading high-performing teams. But we want to get to know you a little bit more. So I've got three hard-hitting questions for you today. Oh, wow. I, don't, I have no idea what these are as well. So it, It's better for vulnerability yeah, and well. authenticity. Yes. Um, let's start with what's your favourite superhero? Favourite, sorry? Superhero. Superhero, um, someone practical. I'm trying to think. Oh God, I don't actually know too many of them. I I always liked I always liked the Batman movies, and I liked Christian Bale because he was a good guy. Like he was doing philanthropic work, and then he went and bashed up the baddies on the weekend. So yeah, I'd probably say Batman because he's um and because he's evolving. Like you know, um, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer. Yeah, I'll say Batman. And let's just say you're going to have takeaway tonight with the family. What's your takeaway food preference of choice? Well, my, my wife has asked me to pick up uh, Thai from uh, a restaurant called um, a restaurant halfway between where we live and where I work. So again, I'll be pragmatic. I'm, I'm getting that Thai. So <laughs> it's already done, Jed. And in true leadership style, I would love to know what leadership means to you what leadership means to me. Oh, it's very easy. It's creating other leaders. Very simple. Yep. And as many of them as you want. And, you know, in, in what sort of areas, like you could create leaders in health. You know, I think all of us have the opportunity to actually turn our patients into leaders. So I reckon that's a really cool first step. Yeah. It's a, it's a great concept to think about how it extends beyond both parties in the consultation room and, and everybody playing a bit of a role in that. So that's great. Now, today we are talking about hiring, interviewing. Firstly, the shortage. There is a huge shortage of whether it be osteopaths, EPs, physios, all across the country at the moment. So the reason why I love this topic and it is a hot topic is firstly, it's a matter of getting that person in front of you for an interview, but then also determining whether they're the right fit for you, for your team, for your culture, and also for your vision. So there's lots of different dynamics. And obviously today we're not necessarily talking about, you know, if you've only got one person to interview, you're kind of a little bit stuck for choice there. But there's certain things that you can do in an interview as well, because you also don't want to hire somebody just for the sake of it, because that can also be, as you would agree, very detrimental to your business. So you've organized a, a great presentation on this today. And I, it's a shame that we're missing a few Victorians out there at the moment who are frantically trying to rebook all of their patients after a five day <laughs> lockdown. I've got bigger priorities, bigger fish to fry. I'm certainly thinking of you. I was there. I've been there to done that. My heart goes out to you, Victorians. Again, lockdown 3.0, they call it. I think in, in our eyes, it's more about 20.0. But this is also, and some of the things that we're going to cover at the end, is not just for business owners who are interviewing and looking to hire and build high-performing teams. 
but it's also for a new a lot of the new graduates in the group or people that are looking to transition across to a, a different job or a new career pathway what sort of things potentially business owners are looking for and what things you can do to sell yourself and also to give yourself the best possible chance of being exactly where you want to be so we're going to cover a, a couple of bases today so for now i'll probably hand over to you nick because you can kick off you've got some slides prepared for us and then I'll kind of jump in and out. If you've got any keynotes or discussion points or any comments from some of the stuff we're talking to today, I'll be checking out the comments box. So let us know that you're here, give us any feedback that you want and we, we can um, certainly share and explore and brainstorm some of the comments and the questions that come up today. And for those of you who are live, yeah, I'd love to hear from you because when I present, I really feed off your questions and we tend to if you were live on this with us and we could interview you, we would do it at the time, but we tend to do it at the end. So, you know, I'd love three really good questions at the end. Let's do what I normally do, Jade. Whoever asks the best question can get a free copy of one of my books, depending on whether they're an owner or a practitioner, and I'll give them the audio book. So uh, there's, there's a little incentive for you to, to act today. Um, and I want to I wanna pay credit to you, Jade, for... Um, acknowledging the elephant in the room with this process, which is the shortage. And I know in our ultimate physio group, like I actually reckon this is the biggest problem that physio owners are facing. But, you know, since talking to Jade about osteo and understanding osteo, osteo owners are facing it too. And yeah, there's more jobs than allied health professionals. So, you know, this process is completely different to what I was doing 10 years ago, because I remember my first hire, Jade, and like I opened the clinic and I was by myself for a few years and literally then I just started getting resumes from highly skilled physios and I'm like, oh, this is easy. You just got to, you know, you've got four people in an interview and one's, you know, more suited than the others and you hire them. Now you've got to go and make your own, make your own fortune and, and extract these people from wherever they are. Um, and yeah, they definitely... I could say to the young health professionals and the mature health professionals who are employees, you got, you guys have got prime position. You know, we're on the back foot, aren't we, Jade, us owners, realistically? Yeah. So, so um, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think business owners are very naive to think that we're not being interviewed ourselves. <laughs> I feel like I'm being interviewed every single interview that I do. Absolutely. And, and within that process, I think now more than ever, an interview process needs to be seen for a business owner to sell themselves and be the job that the person present in front of them actually also chooses. So I, it's, it's a great point to make that these interview processes and hiring works both ways because it's, a long, it's the longevity in the relationship that you're building from day one. So I'm sure we'll come back to lots of that sort of stuff and I think Jade it really helps us as the owners to um, to put our best foot forward and to know that we have to build a business that's friendly for our teams like I always use the analogy when I'm presenting of my wife who's a corporate lawyer she worked in a job for her first two years where they paid her 60 grand a year she billed out like thousands of dollars a day if she couldn't cope with 80 hour weeks, you know, she left and then they've got a hundred people vying for her job. So there are industries and professions where the advantage is to the business, but was it really because they didn't build a team friendly workplace? We're forced to, that's going to serve us well. I believe it will and our teams. Alrighty. So let's crack in everyone. Uh, okay. So we've got four real themes that we want to talk about today. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit, Jad and I'll bounce off each other. And at the end, we'll have your questions. So, um, we're talking about more so hiring here and interviewing. Uh, the, the end result we want is building a high-performing team. But yeah, today we've only got a limited time. So we'll address these four things. We're talking about what to look for. So I, I'm going to talk about my experiences in these four areas. What to look for, uh, best interview questions, red flags, which I'm going to tell some horror stories and yeah, we, I've made every hiring mistake you can make, Jade, and you probably have as well. Absolutely. And if we can help some of you health practitioners to either just feel like you're in the same boat as us simply or maybe prevent you making the same mistakes, that'd be good. And I'll talk a little bit about my system. So what I've evolved over the years to be an interviewing system that's really designed to spit the best person out at the end and best being most suitable. It doesn't necessarily have to be the smartest. Okay, so... 
I suppose I want to open with the concept of a wish list. So if I go back to what to look for, Jade, how the hell do you know who you're going to hire if you don't know what's on your wish list? Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think sometimes though, and I think it, it's getting more and more prevalent that you don't know that you don't know. You don't know what you need. Are you looking for somebody to help take over a mentoring program? Are you looking for somebody to just assist with the labor, which is literally treating patients because you've got a huge amount of overflow? Mm. Or are you needing somebody to put together a structured mentoring program or take over your patient base because you want to step away? So experience is pretty important there, knowing the level of experience that you need. I think you've also differentiated between two hires, which is a replacement hire or a growth hire. So, you know, a replacement hire, you could fall into a simpler pattern as that person did that job. I want someone to replace them like for like, or my business is growing. You know, I want to reduce my time on the tools as the owner, or I need someone to train these physios. So an example was I have a team of physios, I had a team of physios last year between about four and eight years of experience and I wanted someone, I'm 18, I wanted someone in the middle. So I sponsored two physios from South Africa who came here in the narrowest window. They've been here for a month. They've got 12 years of experience and they used to teach their orthopedic manual therapy and I'm already seeing what it looks like. So um, you need a mentor to help you work out what's next, but the replacement hire is generally what I'm going to be talking to you about today. And so that's when it's easier to build a wish list. So yeah, let's explore this concept of a wish list. Okay, so a wish list can be as simple as based on your previous successful hires, but I'd also say a more emotive way to design my wish list that I've done in the past, Jade, is what are the opposite of the mistakes that I've made? So I remember hiring a physio who was really good when she did a locum for us covering another physio, but she was really rude to reception. And so she didn't last at the clinic. So straight away on my wish list, Jade goes, respects reception, respects the admin team. So when you're building your wish list, and I'm actually going to show you my clinic's wish list, and this is my personal wish list. It's based on things that have been good with people we've hired who have gone well, but it's also based on the opposite of things that have not gone well when I've made bad hires. Like I've made heaps of bad hires and it's generally desperation hires, but I'll talk about that later. And um, so at Scarborough Physio and Health, we have a defined culture. It's, it's relief if it's, a, it's an acronym. So reliability, energy, loyalty, initiative, empathy, and friendship. And I also wanted to say that I don't think these things are equal. My team, Jade, know that the, the, attribute that I look for most in people is reliability. Reliability for me is two things. It's doing what you say you will do and it's punctuality. So, because in our clinic, we have a no waiting time guarantee, Jade. If someone waits more than 15 minutes, they get their appointment for free. So I can't have unreliable practitioners. And then the second thing is initiative. So we're a business where we have a lot of smart, dedicated people. An initiative for us is thinking and doing one step ahead. So, you know, during the interview process, I'm testing reliability, I'm testing initiative. And like, if you're, if you're late for your interview, it is super hard for you to claw that back through the interview process because you've just hit me in one of my cultural points. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna show you my wish list. So our region is called Redcliffe. I'm sorry if this is small, but I'm going to obviously say what they are. Okay, so it helps if you love Redcliffe because our vision is to make Redcliffe the healthiest place in Australia. If you're from inner Brisbane and you don't give a shit about Redcliffe, that probably won't work. You're healthy and active because your job is going to be promoting health and activity. Um, I'm going to go controversial, Jade. Look at this. You have a happy and stable home life because when I've encountered uh, potential team members who are either working at my clinic or not yet, if this hasn't been good, their performance has gone down the toilet. And I know I have ways of asking questions around this that oh, maybe it's a bit sensitive because technically you're not allowed to, but when you get to know a person, they, they divulge. I'm after rough diamonds, not, a, not prima donnas, Jade. And those of you who've never heard me speak before, you can probably see I'm a rough diamond. I'm a bloke from country to Woomba in Queensland. You know, my first job was picking lettuce on a farm. I'm after rough diamonds. I want people with realistic salary expectations and I really love um, Michael Risk's I Move You group. There was a really good salary survey there. 
I'm after someone who, as well as their expectation being realistic, if they want 150 grand, if they can show me how they're going to get it, yeah, I'll hire them because I want someone who understands there's a link between what you're paid and your performance. I want what I call a proven caseload builder and someone who doesn't early discharge. Now, team player is a bit of a, um, how would you say, it's almost a generalisation these days, Jade. So I suppose if I was to define how you're a team player is you behave in ways where you do positive activities and actions to help your fellow team members. Um, so like uh, our practice manager's son, he had a sore back this morning. A physio came in early to treat him. She put it out in the group, our um, internal team group at 6am. He came in half an hour early. That's team player. Um, respects admin and the admin chain of command. Uh, is a culture fit, so the points of our culture. I want people, if I'm going to invest in people, Jade, I'd love them to stay four years. I also want them not to be high maintenance, loved by patients, they want to grow. And probably most importantly, Jade, they fulfil the need that we need at this very given time. So, um, yeah, what do you reckon about that? Any particular comments or, or thoughts about that list? Yeah, I, I think it's there's no surprises. A lot of that resonates with me. Definitely the the home life and the family life. You don't just hire an individual. You hire everything about them: their family, oh, their yeah. partners, their dogs, their loves, their leisures, all of those sorts of things. And yes. one of the things that that we say at Western Region Health is anyone can be a great osteopath, but you hire a great person because we've got policies and procedures and structures and mentoring in place to make practitioners great. You've got to get a good person. And similar to your list, we've got character, consistency, core values, you know, contribution, culture. They all start with C, surprisingly. All those things we look for as well because our job as mentors is to make brilliant hands-on manual therapists, practitioners, support networks and teams but all those other things on the list, and I did notice, and I don't think it's a surprise, you didn't put great manual therapist. No, I think that can be taught. And I've got something about that in the red flags, to be honest, Jade. But, yeah, like you, you know, can you teach character? I suppose you can nurture character. Um, but, yeah, like there's nothing about skills on there. That's part of my interview process. So, yeah, yeah. That'll, come, that'll come later. And I think for us, it's more exactly those things. In an interview, you're wanting to dive into the sort of person you're going to be spending each and every day with and the person you're bringing into an existing culture that hopefully is really, really positive. And one thing I've learned in the past, it can take one toxic person or toxic mindset to certainly flip over the apple cart is that a quote I could use. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't take very long. You can have a downward spiraling culture within days and weeks just by introducing another personality. And so. what I've found you want to do, Jade, so the owners I work with, many of them will have that person and the worst impact of that person is your best person leaving because of them. So when we think about the difficulty of letting that person go, that's what you've got to think. Would you rather let that person go? Or would you rather lose your best person and then let the other person go anyway? So yeah. Yep. And you've got a duty of care as a business owner to pick somebody to come into your family at work, so to speak. I mean, we spend, uh, you know, there's, there's heaps of research to say that we actually spend 60% of our lives with our working colleagues over our lifetime. So we actually have a duty of care to pick, not necessarily pick is the wrong word, but, but put a lot of effort and thought process into choosing the right people. And this is your environment. Like, you get to create it. You're the creator of a, a piece of uh, a piece of the environment where people come and they want to feel good. And you know, your your team and your workers feeling good together is just absolutely critical. And this is, you know, when we reflect back to the fact that there's more jobs than therapists, when a therapist comes in, if they really get taken by your environment, Jade, my goodness, they want to be there, don't they? And, you know, if, if your job is 80K and they're on 100, the last physio we hired, that's what happened. So, and the type, the type of 
person you are is the type of practitioner that you will be. And your business and your culture is a reflection of your personality, is of your core values. And it's also very important to your brand. And so you need to respect your own personal and business brand and so do those people around you. And by hiring the right people, that's, that's a great reflection of, of the choices that you make, exactly as you say. And don't feel like if you're not where you want to be, don't feel like this is where you'll stay. Because I had an experience five years ago, it was my lowest point where I offered a good physio a job. The physio knocked me back and said, it's too far away. And then they took a job with someone two minutes down the road from me. And it made me think, I really don't have this place as I want it to be. And it's not, we're not an employer of choice yet, but we're definitely on the way to that, Jay. Okay, cool. Better keep rolling. So, um, yeah, we've spoken about the wish list, the success predictors. Next thing we're going to talk about is interview questions. And I'm going to give a broad overview. We won't go so deep here because this is a big topic. Okay, so I'll talk about my evolution. So, you know, the, the first situation that we tend to be in early in our business ownership career with interview questions is we tend to follow an HR type of system. So, you know, HR normally does the hiring in a larger organisation and HR is the most missing part of most allied health clinics in terms of uh, headhunting, interviewing, um, optimising team performance and exiting people where necessary. So, you know, you're asking the very HR style questions initially. Um, and I remember doing some work with Jason Smith in about 2013 on his Iceberg Leadership course. So back in motion, the physio franchise, where they did a, a good segment, Jade, on asking good questions. And it was asking questions that someone had to delve into a previous experience that had to extract. So I think that was my next evolution is you're starting asking questions but the person doesn't necessarily have to demonstrate anything. You're evolving to the point where you're asking questions. Tell me about a time where X, Y, Z, it can be anything. And so they're going into their experience. The type of questioning I always had challenges with was the very strategic, you know, you'd call it your Fortune 500 or your Google or Facebook working for a, a tech company where you ask really left field weird questions and I could never bring myself to do that, you know, like the whole, a train's going 40 miles that way, what colour's the sky, you know, I, I never really cared for that. So basically, I, I've come to this process that I really enjoy and I modify this for whether this is a one-on-one -on -one or a group interview, phone or in person. Okay, so the first bit is tell me about your ex to date. An ex could be their job or their life. It's what's relevant to them. So if I'm interviewing for a new graduate physio, I'm not going to go tell me about your last job because what are they really going to have to say? They're going to talk about working at, you know, a junior in a, in a clinic or something like that. I'm wanting to know about their life. Tell me about the highlights of your life to date. What has gone well for you? What have you loved? What hasn't gone well? What haven't you loved? And what's the next, you know, week, month, year look like? So say a, an important hire, Jade, like a practice manager. Many practice managers are going to come to uh, apply for your job and they never worked in an allied health clinic before. You want to know about their last job. You want to know about the areas of that last job that really fulfilled them. You want to know re what really got on their nerves. If they say, oh, well, I hated dealing with people, you know, I... There was always people in my office that was very busy. It's, oh, shit. Well, we're a physio clinic with 500 people a week through the door. What do you want next? You know, I want a job where I get to mentor and train team members. I want a job where I'm not always at work. So I've found, Jade, that when I modify this sequence, I generally get the most information that's most relevant to me to work out where this person should move on to the next stage of the interview process. So, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's. I guess it's. It's hard when you 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 want to. Uh, so common things occur commonly, and by the time we are sitting in a position where we're giving interviews as a business owner, we've usually sat interviews ourselves before, whether it's been in our early jobs or our first, you know, osteo or physio job that we've ever had. And there's, there's a common rule of thumb that is, if it's the way it's always been done, then that's what I should do. You ask the classic questions about, and, and I do, one of the questions that I ask is, tell me about your first job. Because I love 
I think that's a, a great rep representation of work ethic. And I am from the Western suburbs of Melbourne. I lied about my age when I was 14 so that I could start working at a, at a bakery. Um, my grandfather had, father had me working when I was nine years old in the garden when I was <laughs> on a sick day. It's the way that I've been born and built. And I think work ethic is another thing that's really, really difficult, but also I also know that I'm a bit of a dinosaur when it comes to that sort of stuff now. And work ethic is not necessarily your hustle and grind labor anymore. It can be a thought leadership. It can be, you know, mental compassion. It can be all those sorts of things. So I certainly recognize that times are really changing, but to give yourself a bit of a script like you've got, I guess, sets you up. But the common themes that I can see through your questions is that you're wanting to know about the person because even at this point here I haven't heard you ask about anything clinically at the moment and I think is that, is that my question to you is that part of the second part of your interview is once you actually get through this whole pulling apart what's your life like what do you love tell me about how you respond about things is it then okay now let's take the next step and I know that I'm probably jumping the gun here wait for the reveal Jade wait for the reveal you like I, I want to know <laughs> I guess from you when you do start asking about okay we've got through this yeah. they do represent my list they do have all the things and they are a great person and I'll offer some research on being likable and how we hire likable people later on but um yeah, I guess I, I, I'm interested to know without jumping the gun when your interview turns clinical. Yeah. And I'll if take, it even does. It does. And I'll take you through that. And um, I would say in the second half of the process, just to, to not be a spoiler, uh, but yeah, there's a further process and there's a second half. So I'll, I'll go through that. The fourth one we're doing today is my system. So I'll, I'll reveal what my system is. So I've got that, I've got that in hand, Jade, but thank you for, uh, for giving everyone a bit of a, uh, a taster. Okay, so just to finish the questions off, like just a few favourite questions for me. Here are a few of my favourites. I love what's your biggest mistake. Love it. And Jade's very big on vulnerability, as many of you who know Jade well would know. Uh, and, and I again, I adapt the context. Like if I've got a physio who's three or four years out, I think I'll ask about work, but sometimes ask about life. It depends how well they're opening up and revealing. I don't want to push the introverts too hard with this. Like you can push people too hard. But if you've got a really good rapport with someone, you could go life. You know, what's the biggest mistake you've made in your life? Tell me about that. The hardest thing you've had to deal with. So, like, I'll tell you what, um, you've got some really good questions to ask people about how they handled 2020. Like, we, um, we hired a senior admin last year, Jade, and we had it down to two, and we asked each how they handled coronavirus, and that one question alone sort of dictated who we hired uh, because one of them just fell in a heap. So, you know, we want people who are resilient. Um, I love, I love asking what they liked about their last job, what they didn't like. I love being able to show them if something they didn't like is the opposite of what they would get with us, but also how I can help them succeed in this next job if they've actually thought about that. Like, obviously, the more they've thought about this, the more they can see themselves working with us. And I love the what did you love or hate about your last boss? Because you know, Jade, that oh, my last boss was a dickhead. And it's like, oh, okay, thank you. Well, I'm just going to be the next dickhead in about two to five years. So, yeah, I, I, I love respect when it comes to, okay, well, the boss and I didn't see eye to eye, but I'm okay with that. And that's why I'm moving on. You know, I, I like to see if there's some element of respect or even acknowledgement of what that person did get from that clinic. Like I've been a physio at this clinic for five years and yes, I didn't like that the boss did this, but I acknowledge that I have grown in these ways. Like, I think that would show maturity and insight for me, Jade. So there are a few of my faves. Any real, what's your favourite, Jade? Can I ask? I think I've got uh, well, exactly some of those things that kind of draw into how people deal with difficult situations, resilience building, vulnerability. I think if people share then you share back. And one of my, I, the things that I seek in an interview process is to create a conversation. Exactly mm. as you said, for those introverts, it makes people comfortable. It makes people feel like you're actually equally interested in them as well. And some of the research I'll talk about later is about the follow-up question. So there's question, answer, question, answer. The follow-up question concept is an extension of a discussion, which mm. is really, really nice. And it's a really nice way to have an interview so that people feel like they're actually equally contributing to it. And that's where that notion comes back in of 
of being interviewed yourself. And I think I actually even verbalize that. I'm not naive to think that you're not interviewing me right now. So what do you, you know, what are you wanting to hear from me? But how can I help you succeed more? I think that that's a great question, like having it really, really clear and outlined like that. But I think one of my favorite questions that I have just, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a bit of a novelty question. Uh, and it came from a personal experience from my husband and I, and I don't want to bang onto it too much and, and take over mid presentation, but I think that people deal with life, how they deal with getting a parking ticket. <laughs> and it's a really interesting concept and it's a question that I ask because I so imagine that you had just pulled up out the front of a shop you know that the meter is past so it's it's five minutes to five and the meter finishes at five o'clock yeah. and you've just got to run in and pick something up and you're going to be two seconds mm. my husband and I did that I come out back out to the car I've run in and there is a parking inspector putting a ticket on our car so I have the question and I, I give that scenario before I divulge how I respond and how my husband responds. And people respond to this process in, in four different ways. And I'm going to give you, share the example of, of one girl who I hired is one of my most brilliant practitioners to date and what her answer was. So there's number one, which is where you kind of think, gosh, you get a bit agitated and think, gosh, I knew I should have put money in the meter. I knew it. I knew it. And it kind of rattles you a bit and it, it irritates you because you've got a ticket and it was just, you know, the guy could have probably let you off. Then the next one is where you actually have an argument with the parking inspector and you sort of plead your case. The third one is you take the ticket. You're not overly fast. You put it in the glove box and you're probably late paying it because you're just a bit meh. And then the last one is where you have a look around at a strategic way of getting out of that fine, whether it be that the sign wasn't clearly displayed or you are an upstanding citizen and you actually go above the parking inspector. You don't take it out on them, but you write a letter to the council or there's what my husband did, which is attack the parking inspector and say, I'm right here. What do you need to give it to me for? Can't you be a good bloke and get really, really agitated. And my final response, which is one that I've had heard once over the 15 years that I've been asking this question, which I'll ask you what your response would be. But she said, there's another option that you didn't give me. And I was like, okay, what's that? And she said, well, I wouldn't get a fine. She said, there's no way I wouldn't have put money in that meter. I was like, I was thinking so I would have parked somewhere else, Jade. Like, yeah. why would I have even parked there? So the great thing about that is there's no clearly no right or wrong, but it yeah. does open up conversation about how people deal with day-to-day -day experiences that mm. would, could either frustrate you and it's a real test of emotional intelligence. So I love That's a good that question. question. Um, and I just bring it up because it's a bit of a novelty. You can't get it right or wrong, but it just creates yeah. conversation and it's really nice because usually we've got more than just two people in an interview. So yeah, she's been one of my greatest performers ever since then because I just know that she's always going to put money in the meter. And we, yeah. use that, we use that culturally because we always say at our workplace, don't attack the parking inspector. If somebody's delivering the rule or the policy or procedure, don't attack them when you know the process. Either take it to council, don't do it in the first place, don't vent to other people and ruin their day, talk to people about how you're feeling. Yeah, I've heard you say that in one of your seminars before, Jade. So, yeah, I love it. And another point that you mentioned there that I like was surface level questioning rather than going deeper on, you know, when you get a charge from someone, like if you get shock, if you get raised or lowered volume, if you get a tear in the eye, you know, in the interview process, that's where you can go deeper. I remember I did a phone interview with a physio once and I just kept her on the phone for two and a half hours because there was something I wanted to find out and she told me right at the end. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. Yeah. But yeah, it took two and a half hours to get there. So I think, guess... think of yourself as a police detective. And You've got to extract information. Would consider an interview being two and a half hours. Most people set a time, they come in, they sit in the waiting room, they welcome them through. Yeah. I think sometimes one of the things we always do is I will always, my time is very precious, my family time, my work time. I always do phone interviews first now, much mm. like I would if I was online dating. I wouldn't go on yeah. a date with somebody or give up, you know, to, I'm happily married, but if I was going to spend two hours back in the day going on a date with someone i wouldn't do that without talking to them first over the phone it's just good old-fashioned yeah should we should we bother with this it's like um i don't know if you watched how i met your mother but barney proposed something called the lemon law which is like a way out of a date after 10 minutes for each person it's like you gotta 
you got a card and it's, oh, this isn't going very well. Boom. Okay. Lay down your card and you can walk away. But yeah, I'm, I'm like you, Jade, where I, I protect my time like the earth, but I also think this is own, true owner's work. I think who you take into the business is the most important that owners can make. So like this whole process, I do spend a lot of time on it. Alrighty, better, better keep rolling. Okay, the next bit's a bit of a fun bit where we can sort of reflect on some of the mistakes that we've made, all of the mistakes that I've made. Red flags, okay? So I like this slide because the dude literally gets smacked in the face by a red flag. That's often how you feel because red flags are like you come back to it, Chad, and you think, oh, I really did see that, but I just ignored it. So I remember, I remember after that sad story I told you about the physio who took a job with my nearest competitor, I had one person left to interview I didn't have a physio and I interviewed him with my business coach. And at the end of the interview, my coach said, I will kill you if you hire that physio. What do you think I did? Of course I hired him. And yeah, it didn't last his probation, but I won't, I won't um, dwell on that. So I'm going to talk to you about some of my philosophies and biggest mistakes, red flags. Okay. So number one, and this, this will be weaved into the final part of, of my blueprint and my, my interview structure. The therapist with the opposing philosophy. So you go and hire the therapist with an opposing philosophy to you. And what you're going to do is until they leave the clinic, you are going to just butt heads like two dinosaurs. Now, a caveat on this, Jade, is the more senior they are, or if you decide to put them in a mentoring position, how many posts do you see, Jade, in both of our groups where someone says, oh no, I've hired a physio or I now have a physio who's in a mentoring position and their philosophy is to not touch people or see people once or they give every patient a slap on the back as they walk out the room or something you don't like. You had an opportunity to determine this physio's philosophy, this osteo or chiro's philosophy before you put the pen in their hand to sign the contract. So Unfortunately, huge mistake. way too often. Oh, and most, most of the time, Jade, this is because of the desperation hire. This is because I need a physio. This one's left. I need an osteo. I've got one month. I've got one applicant for this job. You know, they're clearly not suitable, but I'm going to fit a square peg in a round hole. And it's not always your fault. Sometimes you need to do this to keep the, the wolf from the door, keep the business open, hire the wrong person until you find the right one. I know, I know that's how I've had to do it in the past. So that's the first one and that's that's pretty damaging. And I'm a little bit different, Jade. Like I, I believe there are circumstances where you do need to hire the wrong person, but you just need to know they're the wrong person and you need to be realistic about it, mitigate it and, and plan for what that transition looks like. Yeah, that's how I feel. Okay, so Jade said one of her favourite questions is to ask about their first job. Okay, so Jade, would you ever hire anyone who's never had a job? Have I got other options? Okay, so you've got you, you've got two new graduate osteopaths. One has lived with the parents and got straight sevens at uni and they've never had a job. The other got fours and fives because they put themselves through uni because they had to work a night job. All other things being equal, who do you hire? Somebody who's had experience in the workplace. Absolutely. So the thing is, be very careful of the slacker and I'm like Jade, I am a bit elephant old school. Was it elephant or dinosaur? Dinosaur. Yeah, dinosaur. What am I saying elephant for? Yeah, so dinosaur old school, work hard is like the ticket to the game basically. And the thing is, yes, I do think you can work smart and all that, but, but I think if it's your first professional job, you've got to have something pretty special if you don't have a hardcore work ethic. So the slacker, I find the best way to unearth the slacker uh, is the um, reference check. So the thing is, even if they've worked a casual job, whatever you do, guys, red flags, do not skip reference checks. And if they list two referees, I call them both. If they don't list a re referee, I find one. You know, the slacker will, will kill your business. But will they kill them as much as the next person, Jade? So the next person is what I call great with the patients, hard to manage. So we've all, you know, any of us have been in business more than five years. The thing is the patients love this person. They're so connected to this person. These are therapists, obviously, um, but it can also be admin. So oh, everyone loves this admin, but my God, for the boss, you just have so much trouble with them. 
I reckon these are the hardest, Jade, and I reckon they're the hardest because every, everyone else in the team loves them too. So you've got a five-year-old osteopath. They're bubbly, they're warm, um, and they're great relationships with your team, the clients love them, but they just keep stuffing you around as the boss. What do you What do you do? I couldn't agree more. I think one of the ways that I mitigate this and I've only learned the hard way is by asking questions about team sports. I think I find a lot of people that have been involved, if it hasn't necessarily been in the workplace, but you know, they've been part of a football club culture or played netball as a child or those sorts of team sports, then usually they come into a workplace and they're a bit more of a team player. But I think there's a difference between confidence and arrogance as well and it's a really fine line to teeter and you can usually feel that out in an interview process sometimes i'm a little bit standoffish with people that are overly confident in an Mm. interview process because if they don't really know me and they're overly confident then they're going to be even more confident when they find themselves in a familiar situation and that's one of my questions to you that i'm going to jump in and ask you now familiarity as people become more comfortable over time, their demands become greater. And that's really hard to find in the very, very beginning. I think that's one of those great with patients, hard to manage. I think the hard to manage, tell me if I'm wrong, usually if it's going to, it will get worse over time once people... Yeah, you're right that they may have more requests or demands very early and and that's then magnify. I'm just trying to think of a real red flag for this. So, so there are, there are people in life that just have a, uh, like a, the boss is, is bad or evil sort of mentality. Um, you know, I would say I had an experience hiring someone who had demonstrated this behavior for previous bosses. And I thought, no, she won't do it for me because I can turn her around. And it ended up like, like this with me in the end as well, just based on something I asked her to do that she didn't respect confidentiality. Um, Yeah. You, you hear it in how they talk about their previous bosses. So the thing is, imagine if you had someone in team sports, I love my team, but the coach was an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. So changing that belief is difficult. And I think when it comes to red flags, there's a few questions that you get if you offer it back and say, have you got any follow-up questions for me? People that go straight in with what am I going to get paid? Ooh, People yeah. who come straight in with how long do I have to work Saturdays for? Yeah. Um, I just, you can see me just crossing them off my mental list. And, and I mean, we do, we get a choice. I just, there's, there's certain times and places to raise those sorts of things. And whilst I think that they're very reasonable, I think salaries, incomes, livelihoods, they're extremely important. So is work-life balance. But I think your delivery of those questions, if you are going to ask them. It's the how, isn't it? How they say it. Strategic, yes. Yep, it's not they say, it's how they say it. And how early in the process. Uh, I would also say, again, reflecting back to the, more jobs than practitioners we get asked it a lot more now than we did 10 years ago when they just want the job because because many people can shop around for jobs now and you know we know that as owners i want to tell you about the last red flag jade so this is this is strongly based on my coaching experience of um clinic owners um many of us desire a practice manager in our business Um, what happens is we tend to initially hire receptionists or admin and upskill them. And based on often previous job qualifications and careers, some of these people are exceptional and can step into a practice manager role, which requires high skill, high initiative, high commitment. But the number of clinic owners I coach, Jade, that are like, help me, I've got someone who I'm delegating all this important work to and either they don't want to do it or they're not suitable, even though I've tried to train them and they're really a receptionist masquerading as a practice manager. So just an extra little flag for you. If you're hiring a PM, you are going to have to make sure this person has those things, the initiative, the intelligence, the commitment, and don't just promote a receptionist into this role. Like, I'm sure you'll have an opinion on this, Jade. So fill me in on your opinion with this particular red flag that, yeah, is a big one for me. Um, and it's so important is how do you find that needle in a haystack, whether it's a practitioner or a practice manager, they're worth their weight in gold. How do you ask questions in an interview that is going to help you find that person that will go above and beyond? It does tie back to work ethic. It ties back to personality. 
But how do you find that? You usually find it through conversation. I usually ask questions like, you know, hey, if I had somebody call in sick, are you the first person I should call or the last person I should call? How do you feel about um, coming in and helping out? If we had to fit in a patient after hours, how would you feel about that? Tell me about your role. I love people who, that old school, Macca's managers. I mean, there's reasons mm. why we love those people. I worked, yeah. I was a manager at Baker's Delight for years. We were taught never, ever to stand still. Never, ever, ever. If there is no patient, you're moving, you're sweeping, you're packing up, you know, baskets of rolls, you're cleaning something down, you're standing with a broom in hand. So, and these things were ingrained into me over the years from a really young age, from an adolescent age. So one of the questions that I ask is, is simply that, you know, if we needed to stay back and also on a timesheet, you know, if you work back 28 minutes, are you going to put down 28 minutes on your timesheet? Are you going to put down eight minutes on your timesheet? There's those tit for tat mentalities and I'm not against people getting paid for doing work, but then there's also people that work from their heart and not from their head. And they're the ones that I love, that we all love as business owners. I'm interested to know if you've got any questions to find those people that go above and beyond. I reckon I get it from their work history more so than their questions, Jed. I want to see the proof. So um, the last time I hired someone who was in this situation, it was a referee check. This lady ran a welding company for two years. She was employed. It was a husband and wife welding company. And a, uh, the woman, the wife was about to go on maternity leave a week later. They gave her a week of training. She ran the company for two years. I, I don't trust answers as much as I do history. Um, you know, one of my favourite saying is how you do anything is how you do everything. So they've done it that way before. I know they can do it again. Yeah. For me, Jade, you've got to demonstrate you've actually done this before rather than saying that you can do it. I, that means not much to me. Yeah. And I think so, skills, also people hire for skills. You look at skills on a CV and all the rest of it. I would hire attributes over skills every single day of the week. Yeah. You can train skills and policies and procedures and all those sorts of things within a business can accommodate for a lack of skill level but you can't create attributes in people where they don't exist and so I definitely do you know ask things like that sometimes you're not advertising for a practice manager and my the beautiful Judy Pullman who my team will know about she was by my side until she retired this year for 16 years she owned a donut shop and I she was a patient I saw her two consultations her work ethic and her nature she became like my second mother I created a job for her my other practice manager Naomi who'd been with me for 10 years absolutely incredible she was my left hand lady and she's still a big gaping hole in our clinic I created a job for her because of who she was not because of the skills she bought she had her own business that was a, a postal service so you don't have to hire a practice manager who comes from another job you hire attributes over skills that's that's how you find those needles in the haystack, I guess. Yeah, you're right. And anyone who's run there, someone who's run a business but may not want to own a business, yeah. so they don't like they don't like risk, but they know how to run a business. Because as soon as you say that, I just have three or four people come up in my head that I know. It's like, yeah, that they would be able to run this business and treat it as their own. Yeah. And that's the key word there. How do you find somebody who eats, sleeps and breathes the business like you and who can represent you when you're not there? I think a lot of the time, Jade, they've got to know your business beforehand. Like I am very big on delving into your database to find this person if you're well established because they know, like and trust you. Like Ruth, my 2IC, most incredible practice manager I've ever met, um, we rehabbed her through, you know, a, um, a lower back fusion. You know, she was a client for 10 years before she worked here. You know, some of you may fear that, but those people trust your business. Yeah. yeah they want to be part of it. All righty. I know we're running out of time, Jade. So uh, let's complicate things. Let's talk about the blueprint and the system, because this is where you want to know where the clinical stuff's going to get um, implemented. Uh, okay. So I, I have anywhere between five and 10 steps in the process. I've developed this process in conjunction with my one of my original business coaches who worked for Action Coach. Um, but I'll talk to you about some of the real key points. So the hoop. The hoop is getting them to jump through a hoop initially to prove that they may want to work for your business. 
Now, if you are a small osteopathic clinic and you're after your first new graduate uh, and you literally would be scratching to find one, you get them and you put them, you put them through a small hoop, Jade. So the small hoop is just, can you have a look at the website, have a look at our culture, let us know what you identify with. Like that's a hoop. It's a very small hoop. A hoop can be asking them to do a personality questionnaire. Like we often ask them to do uh, a disc questionnaire so I know their communication style. Um, now, if you were to go and put out an ad for an admin at the minute, I think the last time we actually put an ad out, we got like 500 applicants. So you've got to have a bigger hoop. And that hoop may be, um, we will accept um, your resume if you come to the clinic and you hand it in. So that was, the, that was the last hoop we put in place for an admin and it worked really well because, you know, there are so many people who apply for a job online or they do it because Centrelink tells them to, but if they physically come into the clinic, I know a lot of the younger owners, I know they get people to do a video, you know, why you want to work for the place. I think that would work if the position that you're advertising for, Jade, you have potentially a lot of applicants, but for practitioners these days, don't make the hoop too big. Okay. Now, the second part is the real key, which is the group. So if you can get them through the hoop and provided you've got, you need more than one suitable applicant to run a group. So a group interview for me is anywhere between two and four people. If I have eight good people, I'll do two group interviews. It's an hour and a half. Uh, it's questions. It's alternating who goes first. Uh, they're broad questions. I don't tend to go too deep at this stage. And there's a written at the end. And they also write down their salary expectations. Now, it's rare that the interviewer or the business owner has the power in this process, but the group interview is one place that they do because applicants can see each other. Oh, you're also applying for this job. It makes them want it more. So that's the group. The next bit, Jade, is the clinical bit, the trial. If I'm hiring for a physio, I will have them treat a real client who's one of our team with, with a, a problem, an ache or a pain somewhere. I'll, I'll sit in the corner and watch them treat. If it's a massage therapist, I have one of our team have a massage with the therapist. If it's an admin, we have them come in and do three or four hours of paid work on reception. This is where we actually get to see how they are, but as well as us seeing how they are, it's them seeing if they like the place, especially the way the admin does it. You know, oh, well, this is too busy for me. We had an older lady last year, we wanted to just sub in for a couple of hours and she was overwhelmed doing this, Jade. We didn't go any further. And Practitioners, this is where you get to see the clinical fit. So, Jade, if you want a hands-on therapist and you don't see him touch the patient in the console, what are you thinking after that? Well, no, for starters. <laughs> yeah, is that part of your skill set? You know, do you know how to do that? Did you just not do it because, yeah, I reckon we all need to do this clinical trial to save the heartache of hiring someone with an opposing philosophy. You'll find out in this process, even though you're in the room, They'll be on their best behaviour, but they still can't hide who they are. Okay, so the next one after that's what I call hard questions. So a practitioner, Jade, you know what I'll do? I'll bring them in and I'll show them the diary. Like I'm trying to see if they freak out about how busy we are and how busy our practitioners are. And some of them are shocked. Some of them oh, take it in their stride. It's fine. You know, this is where we talk about money. This is where we talk about Saturdays and after hours and leaving the clinic to do work. Basically, I throw heaps of hard questions at them and then they throw it back at me. And then should they get through all those steps? Here's how I do contract negotiation and a warning for a lot of you guys. Don't email anyone a contract without walking them through every step in that contract. If you can sit down with them and talk them through every step because the legalese can freak people out. Uh, and the, the second best alternative from stepping them through it is talking them through it on the phone. So if they're overseas, you want to get on the phone or a WhatsApp or Facebook call or whatever, talk them through every step. And just a horror story, when I first did this, Jade, I had crazy restraint um, locations because I didn't know what I was doing more than 10 years ago. I had a physio not come to me to discuss it, but go to a lawyer to discuss it. So it's like, when I look back, it's like, yes, my restraint, you know, location was too big, but why didn't this dude just come to me? That's what I said to him. So uh, we learned so much through this process. Yeah, and and on that, we we don't ever give out a digital copy of contracts. We only ever give a hard copy. We sit there and we, you know, if they request a copy, we'll give them a, a printed copy. 
Um, but otherwise for exactly those reasons, you, you know, you send somebody a digital copy, they can email it out to five different people who will give them five different opinions and you're not there to kind of answer the questions. And most of the time, none of us are HR or employment lawyers. We're advised to be able to put certain things in it that we put in and we want to be there present to be able to articulate why there's certain things in there and why there aren't. So yeah, absolutely. And the, I guess one of the things on the hoops, which I love, I love that you call it the hoops. There's actually a lot of evidence. And there was a, actually a, a research paper that actually looked through colleges in America and the frat houses. So the Omega Delta Zelta and the initiation processes. And they actually discovered that the harder the initiation process, the more the individual wanted to actually be in that fraternity. So. It, yeah, and so it, it becomes neurologically ingrained that the, the more that you strive and the harder you work for something, in the end, the, the steeper the fall if you don't get it or the more you actually push to get it. So there's actually a lot of proven research around that. So we're not suggesting that you have sort of an initiation process and it make these hoops horrible, hmm. but exactly as you said, I love it. I love the hand delivery of the CV to actually, I mean, we did advertise as well we got and it's particularly in COVID we had 250 CVs for an a senior admin officer within four hours yep uh, no imagine if that job for ran for a month Jade imagine if you had it up on seek for a month you'd have 10,000 yeah so look Scary. I love I love those red flags and I do think the practical side of things and you know, I think we at Western Region Health, we copped a lot of stigma at one point for, you know, the burnout and overworking and all the rest of it. And ultimately, we, we have a lot of wellness checks on our team. We track KPIs. We make sure that they're not seeing too many patients. But our clinic also attracts practitioners that want to be busy. They're hungry. They want to learn. And they, one of the things they say in the interview process is, I want to be busy. I don't want to be quiet. So yeah. we end up hiring them and we also then attract more of those which is great it fits in with our culture and our philosophy and and you know from the last surveys we did they're all very very happy if you are not wanting that then that's some of the questions that you ask when you're in an interview is what's expected of me do you track kpis and if that makes you nervous then you also have a choice not to take a job there as well and that's very very liberating as well to not take a job and to also look elsewhere and, you know, particularly with supply and demand, you, you do have a right to be interviewing business owners equally. Yeah, I, th I think it's our job at the minute as owners to sell the position to the applicant really well. So they want it because they do have so many options. Uh, and I think, as I said earlier, it's, it's the environment you create as an owner when someone comes in, like meeting members of my team through, through the process, important to hire meeting members of my team is something that really does attract people. Like I'm, I'm looking at attracting quite a high level team member at the minute, Jade, this person currently runs a business. So I've had a conversation with them. Then I went to lunch and then Ruth has been to lunch with them. Like this is literally a planning of the seed. This person is going to make this decision very quickly. So I would also say the more important the hire, the more critical the hire the, the more you may need to modify this process. Like if you're hiring a 15 year old admin, um, you know, you can probably run five or six people in a group interview. I, if I was hiring a 15 year old admin, I'd do a group interview, I'd get them in for two hours and then I'd offer a position. You know, you don't need to. The other thing about this process is, you know, the old adage, Jade, hire slow, fire fast. I think hire slow is bullshit. If you're not the first to make an offer in this economy, there are so many, especially practitioners that will take the first offer. You can do that in a week. What I just showed you here, I'll just bring it up again. You can knock this off in a week. You can do the, the hoop on a Monday, the group on a Wednesday, get them in the next day and offer them the contract on a Saturday. Like it can be done. Yeah. Without, done. I mean, I, I haven't heard too many people stretching the pro, maybe stretching the application process out. Well, that's what I mean. Like, see, yeah. the thing is many people assume with that many steps, you've got to do one step every week and the thing takes a month. And mm -hmm. then, you know, they've had four other offers in that time. This doesn't have to take a month, Jade. It can take a week. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think the, the breakdown that you've given us, I'm sure the people who are watching agree that just to break it down like this and to actually have a system for it, rather than going into something blinded off the cuff, 
you're, you're doing yourself a disservice these days. You need to actually prepare for these sorts of things. So you, so you as a business owner can give yourself the best possible chance of hiring the best possible uh, team member. And don't beat yourself up. Like my first physio hire, Jade, I'll tell you about him. We went to a first aid course, five people, only two males there. What do you do? I'm a, I'm a physio owner. What do you do? I'm a final year physio. Where do you live? Scarborough. Where's your clinic? Scarborough. You're hired. You know, that, that, was my, that was my first ever physio hire. So whatever stage you're at, like this is an evolution. Like Jade and I have both interviewed hundreds of people. And even if your process is not as good as you want it to be, just, just modify it by one step every time. And, you know, within three or four years, you'll be running a really good hiring process. Yeah. And I've got a, a pizza route philosophy. If, if you live on the pizza route where somebody can deliver you're the best they're the people that come in when you need somebody to cover a shift they're the people that come in super early they're the last person people to leave because they live nearby if you're in the live in the western suburbs of melbourne you're going to be at the top of my list just because of demographic and that's just a bonus really uh well i weave that into like our vision is about redcliffe so if you don't if you're not from redcliffe like if you're from brisbane 45 minutes away it's hard for you to buy into that vision so I completely agree. The closer you live to the clinic, the better it's going to be. But I want you, I want you to be someone who gives a shit about this region. Yeah, and I think to to sort of tie it all in together because we're running out of time. You, you and I could talk underwater. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's save these guys the heartache of uh, listening to us all afternoon. But I think at the end of the day, and I always like to bring in a little bit of research. There's some amazing research by Rachel Lane, Harvard Business Review, who took they basically assessed over 2000 conversations and it started with online dating. And what they did is they broke people up into two subset groups and one group, they encouraged them to ask follow-up questions anywhere from four to nine follow-up questions. And then the other subgroup, they asked them to avoid asking follow-up questions. And then there was a group that they kind of just allowed them to let go, which is sort of your, your median section. So they analyzed over 328 scripts And they found from that, that people who were most likable on paper, so got a follow-up date and then they took it across into the corporate world and did it in an interview process, were people that asked roughly about five follow-up questions. So not mirroring, not partial questions, not direct question answer. A follow-up question is a question initiated by something already up in a conversation because it shows listening, engagement and interaction. So for those of you who are about to go into an interview, the end result is that you will get a second date or you will get hired if you are likable. And the common theme for being likable is asking follow-up questions. So don't wait to the end when they say, have you got any questions for me? That whole cliche (laughs) thing and you think that you've got to come up with two. Evidence doesn't support that you're going to be likable. So my my suggestion from that and from what a lot of the research shows is to be likable and to give yourself the best possible chance, ask follow-up questions and turn an interview into a conversation. That means both parties being the business owner, showing that you're interested in somebody, showing that you're engaged and showing that you're listening and then equally delivering that in return because above everything else, above all of these suggestions and everything that we could give from all of our years, people hire people they like. First and foremost, if you are likable, you'll get hired. And then you've got to jump through the hoops and all the rest of that stuff, which is really, really strategic and a, and a smart business owner would do all of the above. But if you're a new graduate, not knowing where to get to or how to go about it next, then strategically think about follow-up questions, listen in the conversation, and then follow up with a question that relates back to that and you'll give yourself the best possible chance. And yeah, be confident because if you're likable, then the clients will like you and the other team members will like you as well. So, Yeah, absolutely. So, oh my gosh, thank you so much, Nick. I knew that that was going to be amazing. You What a whirlwind. I, th- I think we went like twice as long as I thought we would, but that always happens. Yeah, it always happens. So how, how can we hear, I mean, I know, I certainly, I have the luxury of being in contact with you all the time, but other people who don't really know you, who want to get in contact with you, how can they find you? How can they find more of your work? Where do we seek out the ultimate physio? So um, 
first place, the easiest place is, this is for everyone, the website, www.ultimate.physio. Um, I've got a, a popular blog and I've written some really nice books that you might enjoy. Uh, and if you are a clinic that employs physios, you can join an extremely interactive Facebook group with 1,400 Aussie physio clinic owners called the Ultimate Physio Physio Clinic Owners Mastermind Group. So the website or the group, uh, my name's Nicholas Schuster, S-C-H-U-S-T-E-R. If you're extremely inspired by anything I've said, you could send me a Facebook message. Um, I'm happy to help you. I like helping people and giving them resources. I've obviously got some, my resources go all the way from free stuff and videos all the way up to nine month courses for clinic owners. So yeah, I've got a lot of stuff out there, Jade, but yeah, I enjoy the conversations we have and I hope that, I think that we're both providing uh, really good value for um, allied health clinic owners. I agree. Thank you. And thank you for your ongoing contributions into the group all the time. You are one of our GRX leaders and that is certainly well deserved. So thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for tuning in today. And Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, feel free to uh, throw some follow-up questions on this post. And if you tag Jade or I in them and we see them, then we'll happily answer them. So good to be back. Looking forward to many more. We'll stay tuned in two weeks' time. We've got Michael Mannix coming up talking about psychometric profiling, disprofiling, which can also help support team cultures. And that's going to be a... Lovely flow on from this, Jade. Lovely yeah. flow on. A new offering that we're going to be doing at Growth RX, which is uh, some private consulting with business owners and teams in team development and disprofiling. So we'll see you on Thursday in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. See ya. Have a good one.